Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, folks. Michael Zuber, one rental at a time. Back to this good friend, Dion from Dion Talk. How you doing, buddy? Howdy, doing great. Ready for round two. Hey, man, one of the things I'm really excited to talk about is, again, I've been calling for a real estate slowdown for a while. It is clearly happening. It's happening at different rates in different areas. Uh, one city that I talked about specifically months ago was Boise. Uh, Boise, as of today, or at least as of yesterday, let me get the number right, 40... Where's my notes? 43% of Boise's active listings have had a price drop in the last 30 days. So I want to talk about price drops because they are going to happen frequently across the country. And I want to make sure people understand what I think about price drops, why they're good or bad. Does it mean values are falling? All of that stuff. So Dion, have you seen a bunch of price drops in your buy box? Not yet. I've seen more listings that are sitting for a while, which means under asking price offers are going to make sense, which is the equivalent of a price cut. But I haven't seen people, I haven't seen a lot of the listings come back on as, as price reduced, price reduced, price reduced. We talked about two months ago about Boise, where a lot of people were moving for political beliefs to Arizona, Florida, and Boise. And then the worst winter in 10 years hit Idaho. And not so much boomerang. They're not going back to California, back to Washington. They're going to move from Idaho to Florida and Arizona yeah. and other options that you know aren't, aren't frozen tundras for four months out of the year. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. So I, I I'm clearly seeing it right. I talked to agents in Southern California on the East Coast. Uh, price cuts are coming. I want people to understand what a price cut is. Right. So again, we have to go through the process of listing a home. Right. You're, a, you're an owner, you reach out to an agent, you sign a listing agreement. During that process, you and your agent, sometimes you, your agent, and their broker agree on a price. Sound fair? And your spouse, you talked your spouse into it because of this crazy high number you thought you were going to get. Exactly. So for most agents and most experiences, the homeowner will win. Let's say there's a disagreement on price. I think my home's worth 400. You're my agent. You say 375. Example. Over the last couple of years, not only would you have done 400, you might have done 415 or 420 because you, you reached because there was no inventory. Today, me as the guy who thinks 400, I don't know what's really going on because I only own one home and I know my neighbor Bob got 420 um, or maybe they got 399. Thus, I want more. And you tell me, no, 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 the world's changed. You can only list at 375. I'm going to be angry with you. I am probably talking to lots of agents. And even though you know what you're doing and you think it's 375, I'm not going to take your listing. I'm going to go to the agent that whispers what I want to hear at 400. Does this make sense? It, it does. I have a real life example. A friend of mine wanted to sell a house that they had only owned for about eight months. The agent he bought it with said it isn't going to sell for more the seller was pretty upset, went to someone else and got $150,000 more. And it sold before the sign hit the road. It was under pay. It was under contract. Wow. Like the, the agent had the wrong idea and you don't, you listen to your seller. The seller is the one that's going to win that argument. Yep. So that's what's happening right now. So more and more, and I'm calling these wish prices. So again, some wish prices are going to sell perfect house, perfect area, whatnot. Uh, I feel pretty confident that less wish pricing is going to be successful going forward because uh, we are we the, the real estate market is clearly flipped, in my opinion. Would that be fair to say? Yes, absolutely. Yeah. Affordability, interest rates, all of that. So, again, the, the whole real estate market moves slower. So it would be two weeks, probably 30 days before me at 400 call you up at 375 and go, you know what, Dion, you might be right. Because maybe me and my wife have already agreed. We already found the place we want to move to in Florida and we have to get out. Or I'm going to call you up after 30 days and say, you know what? You wrong. You suck. You didn't do an open house. I'm going to cancel my listing. I'm just going to stay. These are all things that are happening right now. And it's, it's really a messy market. One of the reasons why do the work every day matters so much is those people who said, I'm going to sit on the sideline and wait for a crash or a correction. I have a friend, a couple hundred thousand dollars sitting in his bank waiting for the crash or correction. Hasn't looked at a listing in a year. So he's not going to know that 
once it shifts and it, the sales have happened, it'll be too late for him to take any action. Exactly. Yeah, you got to look at every day. And, and actually, I did a live stream, which I don't normally do this morning at seven o'clock or seven ten or whenever I did it. I've had three pivots in my 22 years. My first pivot was 06 when I sold houses, went to multifamily. My second pivot was when I was buying distressed homes and Wall Street came in or hedge funds came in. And this is my third pivot. What does this pivot mean? I do not believe we're going to have a crash like last time. We're just going to have a boring flat market because it's so flipping unaffordable and we need wage increases. But what I'm doing is I'm increasing my work. I'm writing more offers. I'm doing my daily disciplines. I'm looking for terms because I want to do a deal that was better than last year. The market's changing. And I don't need my market of Fresno to crash 75% like last time. I would love it if it did. I just need to find the one motivated seller maybe who remembers the crash who wants to sell fast, whose property isn't perfect. It's on the wrong street or it's dated. It doesn't pass FHA or VA. And I want to go buy those homes. That's what I'm trying to do. Uh, see if I can remember this right, because it reminds me of a comment that you got on your channel one time. And I, I forget the person's name, but they said, don't listen to the, it was to, to the three amigos. Don't listen to these guys that we just want people to think the prices are going up to prop up the price of our own portfolio. No. As if we haven't been clear that the three of us would really benefit from price reductions, but I, we would be ready to take advantage of that. I, again, if my word means anything in the universe, I would love Fresno to crash 75% again. Just saying. Just saying. Um, again, what, again, my third pivot is about doing better deals, which, which is all about motivated sellers. I haven't seen a motivated seller in two plus years. Motivated sellers today is starting to evolve. I had, a, I had the best investor in Fresno on my channel yesterday, and he's tightened up his buy box, which is awesome. He's leading by example. But we're starting to see more and more sellers relent on pricing. Like, okay, my wish pricing of 400 some people are taking off, which is their right. And others will go, okay, what can you get me? And I'm going to, I'm actually marketing. I brought my team on two or three weeks ago. We're marketing to sellers who've owned their property 10, 10 years or more. I'm fishing for terms. I give a rat's ass about price. I want terms. So again, be a better investor. Stop. Price is like one number and it's not going to move nearly enough to be interesting. Go be better investor. What do you think? I think instead of looking for the crash or the correction, which we're seeing a crash in transactions, I think oh. that like the facts are out. This isn't a crystal ball projection of the future. It's like right now we can tell. Demand has gone away. I, I, uh, it was a Redfin article that came out, uh, 70 something percent in a poll of buyers have pulled back mm -hmm. and said they're going to wait. Find that motivated seller. Find, find you know, create a spreadsheet. The properties that you looked at, how many days on market? I like how you narrow your buy box to look for you know people who have had equity. If you want to get that that into it, but if you want to watch how many days on market, because that's the one metric that will make a seller either pull it off the market or adjust the price. Correct. And then find the price that makes sense to you, and then you have the terms you can negotiate. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Again, I want to be very clear. I'm an open book. I have fundamentally changed my business. Uh, a month ago, it was probably two and a half years. I was mainly looking at first day listings. The only things I won were stuff I acted on first. And, and again, first day listings were full price offers cash. That's what I could offer. And I could do it. You get some, you, you lose a lot. I have now dumped that search. I will not, not look at first day listings. I want to fish with days on market in my market are greater than 15. And I imagine that in a couple of months, it will be 20 or 25 days. I want to fish where, motiva where motivation might be high. Motivation is not high in a first day listing. And again, I, the other thing I'm doing is I will not write a full price offer. The only, again, for two and a half years, full price day one cash. I could do it. I am not doing that anymore. Nothing will be full price. I don't care if it had a price drop. Nothing will be full price for the next couple of years. Everything will be below. Everything will try to, I'll do a cash number and a term number like we've talked about on a past video. And I don't, 
people don't understand. You don't need to do the market doesn't need to crash. You need one seller. In my case, I need three sellers in the entire market of Fresno County to go, you know what? I want out more than I want to hold this asset. That's what I'm trying to do. It's that simple. So a really quick recap. For the last two years, speed was our best friend. I mean, our agents and with me, my, my lenders knew that they had to have that letter of prequalification for the amount of my offer in less than an hour, like all submitted, or I was going to be looking for another lender. Mm -hmm. Speed, we had to get that offer in before sellers realized how many offers they were going to get, the strength of all of those offers, because some sellers didn't believe their agent. I don't think we're going to get anywhere as close to this. And then they get the offer. So then they accept it. Now you have the sunk cost theory where they're going to stick with you because they've already committed that much time to you. Now we're shifting a couple of things. Speed might not be your friend because your negotiating power comes from how long it sits on the market. And then you, you talked about in both scenarios, you're making a cash offer. The last two years, it was asking price. And now it's going to be the price that makes sense below asking. When you do those cash offers, are you buying cash and then doing a refinance after or using hard, you know, are you using one of those loans that lets you say it's a cash offer? I, I'm lucky enough to be in a position where I could write the check. If they wanted to close in three days, I could. I would never write an offer I couldn't perform on. Many of those offers, I do have a non-QM lenders that wouldn't slide in, but I am fully prepared to wire the money if I have to. So, okay. true, so true, true cash. You have an option. You make a cash offer because you have the cash. Once you're under contract, if you can get the non-QM to work, you finance it. Yeah, correct. Seller doesn't care. They get the Does, same amount of money. Doesn't matter. Mm -hmm. Awesome. Yeah. So if I did have to close cash, which I did one time last year, or maybe it's two years ago now, I do the non-QM refi after. Same, same, same. Right. That's, I'm, I'm actually asking for selfish reasons. That's yeah. a strategy I'm going to start using going forward, at least for yeah. the next couple of deals. I think any good or elite investor, which I, I want to put you on that camp, absolutely should take the strategy of writing two offers. Cash offers lower than the cash plus terms. And the beauty of it is all of my term of offers will have math. The, the, the price difference that I'll be offering will be meaningful. It could be as much as 10%, but my yield will be marketably higher because my blended interest rate will be so much lower. Yeah, it's going to be right. amazing. So the last thing I want to say, I get so many comments on my channel. Michael, you keep screaming median hot price isn't going to go down, but now you're telling me to shop for a deal. How can those two things be the same? That question drives me nuts. Drives me absolutely batshit crazy. Median home prices for 2022 are not going to crash nationally. I am shopping in a buy box that is one one thousandth the size of the national housing market. And I need one motivated seller, not the entire market to crash. So what I want to tell these investors that leave these comments are, do the work, be a better investor. You do not need the market to, you do not need Snap to fall 48% to buy Snap shares at a discount. Real estate is an inefficient market. I could buy the house next door for 30% off because I knew the seller needed to sell. It's these people that, it's like, they just don't understand the housing market. It drives me crazy. Well, it's, it's also nuanced in that, home prices in an area can go down mm -hmm. and the median high medium median how price can go up it can if we lost the bottom like we did exactly and so instead of getting that concept they want to argue the words uh, sounds like you said it went up but you're looking for a lower price just like and i think this is where we've been shooting ourselves in the foot with youtube views mm. there is a housing crash coming we want to clarify it's in transactions. And these are the steps you do to succeed and to have better success during a crash of transactions. When the general audience yeah. wants to focus on the word crash and doesn't care about the separation of price versus transaction. And uh, I think that's something we could work on. Yeah. So again, housing crash has already started, guys. Uh, look at new home builds falling or new home sales, sales falling 17% in a month. However, the median price went up 20% because we lost the low end. It's a math formula, folks. Again, we are having a house crash in transactions. I've been very clear about that for months, called it first, called it early. And unfortunately, the median price is going to go up. Why is the median price important? 
it's because the metric that everybody quotes. The median home price really should mean nothing to anybody in their buy box. Absolutely nothing, except that Wall Street Journal, Bloomberg, Fox, all these other people just quote median price. That's why I talk about median price. So, and what I want to do going forward is talk about the housing crash that we're having mm -hmm. and the actions you should take to benefit, which is doing the work, hunting for that motivated seller, watching days on market, like some actual tactics to be successful when we're having this housing crash. And then mentally, I'm going to internalize in transactions. There you go. You know what? We're going to try to give that a shot video number three. Thanks, buddy. Ciao.